Good morning and welcome, Shoto. Thank you. Today we have Shoto Spring doing our Dharma talk. Um, Shoto is a Dharma era of um, uh, Okamura Roshi. Uh, she first met him uh, at Minnesota Zen Center while he taught there and came to study with him in Bloomington shortly after San Shin Ji was established. During her seven years of practice at San Shin Ji, she also became involved with permaculture, joined the local transition town group uh, addressing peak oil and climate change and recognized her vow to stop climate change. Since then, she taught for a short time at Anchorage Zen Community, uh, that would be Anchorage, Alaska, of course, uh, led a walk along the Great Plains KXL route. Is that a, an oil pipeline route? That is the oil pipeline route. Okay. Uh, participated in anti-pipeline action and founded Mountains and Waters Alliance, which includes farming, land care, and teaching that emphasizes our relationship with beings beyond human. Uh, thank you, Shoto. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Hoshin. Good morning, everyone. It's really nice to be with you in this sort of weird technological way. Um, so, before starting to talk, I feel like I have to acknowledge that we're in an exceptional time um, in our lives and in the life of the world. Um, and I won't say very much about that, except that some aspects of this exceptional situation have a great deal to do with the human relationship with the earth. Um, Pandemics arise as, and I, I looked this up in research, um, destruction of habitats and fragmentation of habits, both leading to increased interaction between humans and animals and increased human access to um, things that can cause illness. Um, the massive use of antibiotics in agriculture, which leads to antibiotic resistance uh, bacteria, and the loss of biodiversity, which reduces resilience. Um, we all know about climate change, but it brings us unpredictable weather, food shortages, wildfires, droughts, and more powerful storms. Um, overcrowding, hunger, stress, all of those things in animal research lead to more violence. There are some agricultural chemicals and definitely malnutrition lead to lower intelligence and uh, loss of impulse control, which contributes to the kinds of things that we're seeing and to our difficulty in responding to them. Um, so my ancestors are European as are most of yours, I think. Um, our ancestors in particular separated humans from nature, feared nature, need, thought they needed to control it, idealized, manicured, lifeless landscapes. Um, they destroyed wildness in a way that most cultures around the planet have not. Um, humanism responding to the uh, oppression of the church uh, elevated human beings above everything. And so what we think of as a wonderful and noble tradition um, is part of our culture's assumption that everything everywhere is there for our use 
to consume without responsibility. Um, Buddhism doesn't support that behavior, nor does Taoism, Shintoism, Hinduism, or any indigenous religion, religious tradition that I know of. I certainly don't claim to know about all of them. Um, so the, the term decolonize has a particular meaning in terms of how we relate both to other humans and to, and to the world. Um, so given that we were probably all raised in that, I was raised in a intensely religious Christian tradition, which is a little different because it still had a God that was higher than humans, but certainly the earth was not seen as sacred or as anything but something for us to use. So I'll start with the question of how we change this. How can we rejoin the natural world? Um, biologically, we're animals. Um, we think we're gods. So how do we drop that idea? We have so much power. Um, I think to um, get ourselves away from that uh, almost assumption of our godlike powers, um, well, you can go away from your car and your cell phone and your furnace, going camping is pretty good. Um, but still, um, more like being stranded without a tent and a water bottle. It's like, oh, that things like that happen to us and then we start to not feel so powerful. Um, fortunately, there are other ways. Um, Wow, the coronavirus has probably taught a lot of people that they're not gods. And some of them have refused to believe it. Um, some people on their deathbed still don't believe. They, they just think they've been cheated. So, um, so my question is, how else, how do we get out of this so that we be get, can begin to relate to the natural world? Um, so I'll start with Dogen in Body and Mind Study of the Way. And he says, to study the way with the body means to study the way with your own body. It is the study of the way using this lump of red flesh. The body comes forth from the study of the way. Everything which comes forth from the study of the way is the true human body. The entire world of the 10 directions is nothing but the true human body. When things are your body, you take care of them. And they take care of you. I couldn't get along without my lungs. Life would be extremely different without my feet or hands. And without the air, without the rain, without the trees that make air, what would I be? And Beyond that, however, because that's still those resources. So we wanna go beyond looking at things as resources and look at them as beings in their own right. Um, there have been several places that have started to, to recognize um, beings in their own right. 
um, New Zealand has identified the Wanganui River as a person. India has given human rights to the Ganges River. In Ecuador, the constitution enshrines the right of nature. The Europe tribe has recognized the Klamath River as a being. The White Earth Band of Ojibwe has named the rights of Manomin, which means white rice. Um, and I, those are the ones that I found. There are probably others. Um, when we think of a river as a being with its own consciousness, we treat it differently. It also has a different legal standing and more ability to protect itself, or humans have ability to speak for it and to protect it. And that is why some of these things were done. Uh, wild rice is very threatened, as are all of those rivers. So, um, So I titled the talk in terms of the three pure precepts. I vow to embrace and sustain right conduct. I vow to embrace and sustain all good. I vow to embrace and sustain all beings. Um, so I wanna suggest that as we think, embrace and sustain, that it might help us to notice that those beings embrace and sustain us. Um, I'm fortunate to live in a very beautiful place. And so if I look out the window or if I step outdoors, I can feel that embracing. If I step on the grass, or if I step on the snow, I can physically feel the support. And that's a practice I encourage. We start that one of the ways to begin an intimate connection with those around us is to um, place ourselves in their presence. So, um, so for beginning to let yourself receive the embrace of beings. And I'm going to suggest it's possible to fall in love with a place, a very specific place or a specific being. Um, a long time ago, there was a willow tree at Powderhorn Park in Minneapolis that I just felt loved. Um, a flower, a creek, um, an animal, a wild animal in particular. People love their pets easily, but letting the wild into us. Um, when I lived in Bloomington, I used to go down to Winslow Woods kind of as often as I could for a few hours, just because that was the nearest place that was kind of wild. And wild places are different from places that humans have tamed. Um, when I lived in Anchorage, there I was pretty deep in the city and there was just one place that I could go. And it was the, let's see, um, southeast edge of Winchester Lagoon. And then it was lost. Um, there had been, there was somebody who was, had their tent there like for months. Um, I would see, you know, sleeping bags and stuff. It was a place that homeless people uh, stayed sometimes. And so at one point the city came in, they mowed everything down, they removed all, all what they 
treated as trash. And um, they cleaned it up. And then it wasn't wild anymore and it didn't feed me anymore. Even a weed growing through the cracks in the sidewalk has something to give. And if you look closely enough, the grass that is mowed probably has something to give to. Um, so I would encourage you to go somewhere to find those places or to think right now of where such a place is for you or such a being. And don't go as a God. Don't go as the master of the universe. Go as a fellow creature with something to learn, something to receive. And look, listen with all of your senses, smell, feel, and receive. And eventually a response comes up. Eventually the urge comes up to say, pick up trash or to make a path or to care for it in some way. Land asks us, but we're not accustomed to listening. So we, there's, there's a practice of learning to listen. And then there's response. So I would say a different thing or a second step is to find a place that you can give some care. And it needs to be small enough to be doable, that you can really offer your attention. Um, so I have 17 acres and it's too big. And I ran around and mind of control came up. But there is a little space near my front door where I started. And I just really, you know, I moved earth, I dug up things, I planted things, I apologized to things. Um, and I became intimate with that place for, I don't know, a year or so. And I still plant things there. And I still harvest there and I still mow. Um, but a small enough place then, if it's uh, two square feet, that might be a good starting place. And if it's a uh, flower pot on the windowsill, that might be a good place. But when you come to that place, um, Come to it with blessing and care. Um, back when I was still in Bloomington, I had a part-time job as a landscape gardener. And there was this one place that I would go back to week after week. And I would do some other stuff. And then whatever time I had left, I would pull up Euonymus. I don't know if does everybody Euonymus? It's, uh, it's the scourge there. We don't have it here. We have other things. And, um, and it was hard killing things. And I knew it was out of balance. I had a sense of things. And finally, I found, and I pulled it up by the roots because it comes back from the roots if you don't. And finally, I found a way to bless it that it might be free from clinging. May you be free from clinging was what was in my mind. And I loved doing it. It became a wonderful, wonderful thing to do because I was blessing rather than killing. So when Sawyer was here, he and I, he's, I'm looking at him there. Um, he and I were doing work in the garden and we were weeding and I said something 
about this communication with the plant. And he made some gotchas. And um, this is so good. So, so I hope it's okay to share them. Um, when you're weeding, together with all beings, may we open the ground for new life. May we open the ground for new life. For pruning, together with all beings, may life return to the roots. May life return to the roots. Because of course, when you're pruning, you want the plant to become more vigorous, not less vigorous. Um, clearing a path. I think I accidentally made this one. Together with all beings, may we open the way for new life. Um, sometimes you need to get from here to there, and I've done a lot of paths. And it always involves pulling or cutting or, or altering things in some way. So how can that be a sacred act? How can that be a gap, act of blessing and giving? an act of uh, embracing and sustaining. And then later on, when I was removing invasive plants, specifically because they were invasive, um, I had to calm the hate in my own heart, the anger. Um, if you have not gardened, you might, it might seem strange, but there is an anger, there is an urge to control. And so I finally came to, together with all beings, may you return to your true home. Wishing them not to be exterminated, not to be completely extinguished but to be somewhere where they belong. And we might say that to ourselves too. May we find our true home. May we live there. May we be in peace there. Okay. There's a third thing. And this is still, these are all in the personal actions, but there's something about food. Um, and I am in the early stages of this practice of depending on the earth for food by planting a garden or fruit trees, berry bushes, or by foraging. Foraging is particularly wonderful because it's so not about control. Um, planting a garden is an opportunity to very intimately engage with one plant, one little patch of ground. Um, and um, after that, then you might learn to freeze, can, pickle, salt, store. Um, when your body physically depends on the earth around you, your mind changes. And all I can say, I remember the year when I did not tap the maple trees. And, you know, that's really labor intensive. It's hard work. And it goes on for a long time. And one year I went, I just don't have time to do it. I think it was about my third year. And I just felt something was wrong the whole time. And so I went back to tapping just a little. So, so my tapping of uh, sugar maples and box elders is uh, more of a ceremony than it is a food production, but I get a few pints. And I have that relationship of I ask the tree to give me its sweetness, and it does. So these are practices that are about changing ourselves and the practices for 
caring a bit for the natural world. Um, and as I was writing, I was thinking about this and remembering when I walked with the American Zen pilgrimage uh, through South Texas uh, for 19 days. Um, we were to bring no money and we asked local people for food. Mostly we stayed at churches and mostly they fed us. Um, and I had a conversation with one of the other walkers about why we did that because we were so much wealthier than they were. We were being fed by really poor people. And his thought, which made sense, was that we were placing our lives in their hands. And presumably there would have been some alternative, but by the act of asking them to feed us and shelter us, we were changing the power dynamics so that we belong to them in a way that if we had come and, you know, done hotels and restaurants, or even brought all our own food and cooked it on our own campfires. Um, there's an intimacy that wouldn't have been there. And so I'm thinking about the intimacy that a person has who forages and a person has who lives from their garden um, and a family has when they live from their garden in a community when what happens is they share seeds and they give each other plants and people plant things and then they give each other food and then they get together and, and do the canning or the drying or um, whatever way they put up food for the winter. Um, these are practices that we haven't needed. I think we might need them again, but I don't know. I can't predict the future. Um, and um, there's something about knowing that your life is given. That, that is what I'm talking about. And, and then I had to mention dumpster diving, also known as food rescue, which I learned in Bloomington and I haven't really been able to do it elsewhere. And the last time I was in Bloomington, I went and checked out the dumpsters and they're all locked up. So, um, you know, I have not found an unlocked dumpster in, uh, in Northfield. And um, of course, now I have a position. And so maybe I shouldn't be caught diving dumpsters. Um, but I do notice that Red Pine, at the beginning of each of his books and his acknowledgments, he thanks the US Department of Agriculture for the food stamp program. And he thanks energy assistance and he thanks the local food bank. And I'm thinking this incredible teacher is accepting help from wherever he can get it. Um, and I'm no longer on food stamps. But being there when I was um, took me out of commerce. It put me into the world of giving and receiving, the gift economy, which is the natural economy of the world. And I miss it. And um, there's a mind of rights and there's a mind of obligations. There's a mind of stealing or worried that I'll be stolen from. And um, to cultivate the mind of giving and receiving is, um, I'm working on it and I encourage it. And then finally, I'm going to mention protecting. So I looked at the Soto Shoe website <clears throat> and it has five things that were, um, recommended in our relationship with the natural world. 
not wasting water, not wasting fuel, keeping the air clean. These are pretty obvious and straightforward. Although um, our habits and the world around us pressures us hard not to do these things. And, um, and so it's worth paying attention to whether you let the water run and how many lights are on right now. Um, they say coexist with nature. It is in the embodiment of Buddha. And maybe I've been talking about that. And then it says first, protect the green of the earth. The earth is the home of life. So there's something about protecting that's part of earth care for some of us. And it's sort of a, if you're called, there are a lot of ways that we protect things. One of them, of course, is in our local gardening that instead of uh, using poisons and fertilizers, we learn how to interact with, with the uh, beings of the earth so that we build a soil that's full of little critters. It's full of life and then it sustains itself. Um, it requires a mind change. Um, and then sometimes there are things that are a little larger. Um, so for me, I got involved with um, things about fossil fuels and with protecting the wilderness in Northern Minnesota, particularly. Um, so I'm doing a walk along a pipeline route is, is sort of dramatic. And it was like a big ceremony. And it was also incredibly mundane and ordinary. And um, the day-to-day -day interactions with people were enriching, sometimes difficult. And the day-to-day -day or minute-to-minute -minute set one foot on the ground and then set the next foot on the ground. And um, moving so slowly, being engaged with this kind of grass and that kind of flower. And you know, when you walk along a country road, the cows all come and look at you because they're not accustomed to seeing people walking. People should be in trucks or on horses. And so the cows just watch you and sometimes they follow you. It's like, oh, something different here. And so sometimes we stopped and visited with the cows. Um, so, but the walking was sort of, sort of a ritual and it was like, so, sometimes I think it was, a magical time, which isn't actually the right word. It was a time of intense practice. It was like, okay, now we do this and now we do that. And there's no escape. You know, we had arguments. There's no escape. Um, but if you love something that's being threatened, Or even if you're worried about climate change and you see something about that, um, it's okay to address it. And it's okay to find your own way to address it. It's a practice. Um, so we have to notice. And then the question is, well, what's appropriate? Um, some people give money and Every environmental organization desperately needs money. Some people write letters, some people come to protests, some people do ceremony, some people pray. I chant. Um, some people volunteer in this way and that. 
and some people to show up and climb a tree and get arrested. Um, and I've seen, I've done some of these things. I have ones I like better. And um, I think, what is it again? There's, okay, what is it asking of me? And what am I able to offer? Um, usually when people are taking care of small children, I go, well, that's your job. And every now and then you see somebody who brings their children to the protest and you see 10 year olds running video cameras and so forth. And you go, oh, wow. Um, so it's like, there's, there's no limit to what the possibilities are. And I have no idea what you should do. Um, so I looked up Southern Indiana because I know Minnesota better and I know the Great Plains a little bit. So I looked up Indiana Forest Alliance. Yellowwood State Forest is being threatened. Hoosier National Forest is being threatened. There are legal fights, there are actions. And so should you not have enough, enough work? Should you feel the need to protect your local place? You could check out Indiana Forest Alliance speaking to individuals, of course, and then going, okay, you know, this much or this much. And um, self-care always being important. Um, let's see. Oh, and then I'm going to mention learning. There's a lots of stories around there out, out about what's good for the earth. Um, there's, oh no, I've forgotten the name. That green uh, changing to solar energy and wind energy and stuff like that. Well, it's not perfect. Um, vegans are really pushing that we have to stop eating meat. And it's like part of the picture, have to stop industrial agriculture. Um, and then I brought some things to read. And of course, I um, don't have a lot of time to read them. So I'm just going to pick this one little bit. This one. Oh, this one. Uh, so this is from Martine Frechtel, who grew up on the Navajo reservation and spent 10 years as a shaman in a Mayan village in Guatemala. And he says he's bringing forth this thing from his people, not that we should adopt it whole cloth, but that somehow it's an invitation to us to find our way. And I'm reading just a little bit. There has to be more wild land than is unmined, unhiked, unrafted, unphotographed, unclimbed, unlogged, and uninhabited. Then there is land under cultivation, filled with habitation, dedicated to recreation, or otherwise put to use by humans. Together, wild plants, wild animals, wild people, unexplored places, Unclimbed mountains and headwaters, unrafted wild water, wild air, and the wild unanalyzed depths of anything are a giant culture comprised of a compendium of complex microcultures who, whose irrevocable right of ongoing presence and natural vitality is in direct proportion to the health of all people's domesticated unwild food, both plant and animal, and the health and wholeness of the people themselves. If any wild land or wild water is taken, deforested, denatured, farmed, planted, built on, inhabited, or exploited in any way, without the responsible parties, parties first returning a double amount of already exploited territory back to the jurisdiction of the holy in the wild, then the entire body of the world's food producing plants, animals, land, and water will demonstrate a marked loss of vitality and loss of nutritive capacity to support the world's human population 
in increments corresponding to the crime that doubles cumulatively. In every instance, this old rule is broken. Wow. <laughs> so that, that's, that's poetry. He's totally serious about it. And I'm just, you know, I, I think about it whenever I go into the woods. Um, does anybody have a question or a comment? Um, I was thinking about when you were talking about um, picking a small place and caring for that small place, I was remembering our last land care retreat at your place. And that's exactly what you asked us to do. Go out on your land, find a place, take care of it for where, how long were we there? Two days or something, three days? And simply um, to, yeah. you know, become familiar with that place and care for that place. I thought it was really interesting how each of us found a very different kind of area. You know, for me, I was down by your creek. Um, one lady was taking all the vines off a tree, which was being smothered. Somebody else, I think, was uh, learning about the butterflies and the insects, right? It was really interesting how, you know, there was enough variety that we could find a very small place. And um, I did feel like in the time that I was there, I really kind of became friendly with that little spot that I was working on, even though that was land, you know, it was a place I hadn't been very much. Um, I was there for a short time and then I went home. But I, I do think that's a really interesting practice. Um, you know, it might be, as you say, a place by your own home, but it might be somewhere else to simply go and be and be aware and be present and kind of see what's happening there. Uh, I got to spend a day and a half playing in the creek, <laughs> which was a good practice for me. Um, I think there's a little spot for everybody. So I'm, I'm just, I was just recalling that as you were talking, so. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. I, I think of you when I go there because I think you put those three rocks as an altar. Thank you. Oko, or uh, Shoto. Yes. Uh, I really like your suggestion about um, getting a small practice, something that you do on your own, meaning um, I live next to a nature preserve. Mm -hmm. uh, I walk in there almost every day while I'm home. Uh, I have one tree that's well into the preserve that I go to every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I physically hug it and pat it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it makes me, th it brings me back to what's really fundamental about our practice and uh, uh, there being no separation and realizing our impermanence. Uh, I think about uh, that movie, uh, I did not read the book, but I think it's a movie, Seven Years in Tibet, Mm, and they're expanding yeah. the temple. And so they're digging the uh, foundations and they're unearthing earthworms. And uh, instead of just haphazardly chopping the worms or throwing them off one way, each of the worms are picked up and lovingly taken somewhere and given an opportunity to continue. Uh, I guess I think those are the things that are available to us if we're out of the mindset of whatever we do, we do for ourselves. Uh, it's just not true. We're all in this together with all beings. So uh, just that comment. Yeah, thank you. I'm thinking it's kind of tricky because once you get you become aware of the actual physical interdependence of all beings. And then you can start doing these things for your selfish self. Like we have to save this forest because it creates oxygen for us. And, and then we're back in the business world. 
<laughs> so um, practices that take us out of the business world are um, like you spoke you, of. You know, just, just to uh, touch on that, uh, it occurs to me that, I mean, I'm a, I'm a builder by trade, you know, I, and people always want to build new wonderful houses. Uh, they build things that are far more than they need and just an assault on the environment. I look at it as actually uh, a, a conservation act, a conservation of the environment to buy an old house, mm -hmm. a place that already exists. And preferably one that's really old because many people have moved through there and used it. And uh, I don't know, I've had this conversation with my wife a number of times. She, uh, she has a 170 year old house and we think about how it used to be a huge farm and how they did everything on this farm. They made their entire lives and uh, part of that gift economy, I'm sure, came from that farm with the neighbors at a time when people bartered more. Uh, so I just think that there are those ways, just growing simple things, uh, being neighborly, you know, you help your neighbors. Uh, it's uh, a way to constantly give back and not keep taking from. So. Yes, thank you. The community, Yes. really important. Anyone else? Hi, Shoto. Um, Sawyer, good, yes. Good to see you. Um, nice to see you. It, I'm remembering um, something that you said to me over lunch. For those who don't know, I, I stayed with Shoto for a couple of weeks um, a few months ago and sat Sashin and, and sort of uh, helped her around her place. Um, and I'm remembering over lunch or dinner sometime, uh, you saying during that during Zazen, we sit being created by the universe and creating the universe. And so there's responsibility. Um, and that phrase has remained with me uh, without knowing quite what it means, <laughs> um, but, but trusting it. Um, some of us here are just through a, a three-day uh, at-home retreat. Um, and so Zazen is on the mind very much. Um, so I just wondered if you could say more about how Zazen itself relates, relates to, I guess, the kind, of, the kind of humility that's needed in caring for earth, life. Wow. My first thought is, well, you just said it, but <laughs> um, ooh. well, so I'll just make some words around it <laughs> and you can help me if, if you want. Um, so, you know, my first place of home was outdoors in a kind of semi-wild space. I grew up on the edge of town. 
and had access to woods and fields and things. And, um, and my peace of mind as a child was, was dependent on those things. Um, I could go there. Um, I was home. And then my family moved and to a place that with much less access to such things and they weren't, I had to go to them. Um, and when I was old enough, I did go. I spent a lot of time at a place called Huntington Reservation, which included the beach, a beach on Lake Erie and included a bunch of woods. Um, you can't always go to those places, not to mention they're being destroyed every minute. Um, but um, that wasn't enough. And Zazen is a thing that, that's enough. It makes me more available to that world. So let me say, when, I, when I'm sitting in Zazen, I'm being intimate with myself. Um, not counting the times when I'm you know, generating thoughts and fantasies and escaping from myself. Um, and so I also become intimate with the churnings of the mind. But, um, but other than that, it's like, okay, this body, oh, this hmm, pressure under my right sit bone. Um, the feeling of the cloth on my legs and on my shoulders. The breath and how my chest moves in and out and the sound of my breathing. And then of course, trying to breathe more quietly was one of my initial, initial big learnings because I couldn't imagine breathing quietly. And so it became a way to focus, um, focus my attention and it became a space for intimacy with my body. Eventually, I learned how to not even sneeze when a sneeze was coming. I don't know if I can still do that, but it's like, and it's not necessary. Nobody was going to hit me. Um, but sitting in a group and wanting so much to support that thing which is being given to me and which I'm giving to them and which we're creating together. Um, when we sit together, we, we create this space together. Of course, that's a lie because the other way to say it is, well, Zazen creates us in this space, but it's a mutual creation. And so as long as we're pretending that we're separate beings, we're creating the space of Zazen. Um, it's a way to think about it and talk about it. Um, so, hmm, I don't know. Do I need to say any more? <laughs> that was a great question, thank you. Um, time is moving along. If there's one last question, we can do it. Yes. Uh, hi, Shoto. It's, it's great to see you. Oh, um, I can't see you. Who is it? It's Russ, Russ Skiba. Oh, great. I'm, I'm here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for doing this and, and, and especially talking on this topic. Um, I was wondering, um, uh, you mentioned a variety of, of ways that um, we could express 
our our practice and and our care and our interconnectedness uh, with the earth. Um, I've actually have some resources I'd like to put in the in the chat room here if nobody objects. Um, there is a, uh, a it, for anyone interested in, in more action on climate change. There is a group called Citizens uh, Citizens Climate Lobby that seeks nonpartisan solutions uh, to to uh, issues of, of climate change. And within that, uh, there is a Buddhist action group. Uh, oh. And we have been reading a book by David Loy uh, called oh, yes. Eco Dharma. Yes. It's wonderful, yes. isn't it? It's, it's, it's a, it it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Eco Dharma is a great book. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 an, it's a really nice book on the intersection of Buddhist practice and uh, you got no pants. I'm sorry, my granddaughter's here. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so um, feel, feel free. There's a deep karma reflection. Anyway, I will, um, I don't know if you can get on, if you can join the um, uh Buddhist Climate Change Action Group without being a member of CCL, but I'll include both the general CCL website and and the um, uh, Action Group website, as well as the um, uh, reference for the, the David Loy book. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, about some of the range of, of activities that, that you've been involved in. I know oh. there's such a great range of those. Wow, let's see. Well, so yeah, I, I, I focused on the ones that were tangibly land care. Um, transition towns, and you might still have one in Bloomington. I remember it. Um, they're working to, um, to transform a local community into a community that takes care of itself the way I think Ocean was talking about that, you know, where you and your neighbors actually support everything. Mm -hmm. And so our group, we thought, okay, how does transportation work? How does healthcare work? How do, um, and um, when I came to Northfield, there was a group and they would, they would do, um, canning workshops and things like that. And I was, I was on the edges of it. I have done, let me see. Well, leading the Compassionate Earth Walk was the big thing that I did. Well, first I went to, it, it was funny, when, when I left Bloomington, I finally was free to do whatever. And, um, one of the things that I did was I went to Washington DC 350.org was, was doing stuff at, at the White House about the Keystone Pipeline. Um, and I'm sure that was contributed to the fact that when I went to Tassajara for my two ongos, two uh, training periods, I started seeing pictures on the Zendo wall, on my eyelids and whatever, of walking along the pipeline and eventually did that. Um, what else? Well, so I bought this land. I have this farm. I, um, I, try, I think of it, I, I meant to grow a lot of food, but it turns out that one person who is not skilled trying to grow a lot of food doesn't work very well. Um, <laughs> So, so I'm growing a little food, inviting people to come. And I wish I had other residents, some of whom would be more engaged with the farming than I am. But having had some, some coming and some goings over the last year, it's important to me that everybody who actually lives here is involved with, uh, with the practice and is not just farming. And so I'm just kind of hanging out. Um, let's see. So what have I done? Led the walk. I'm working on a book. Um, 
when I when I give talks, I usually talk about this. Um, learning foraging. Ah, now now I've lost his name. There is a wonderful writer who has three books out now about anything that um... foraging about eating wild in a way that actually makes it real. And um, eating wild changes your life. Um, so what do I, you know, it's kind of funny because I feel like I don't do anything. And yet my whole life is organized by this principle. So I drink rainwater, for instance. Um, I don't have trash collection. Although somehow living in this modern world, I generate a little trash, but it's so little. When I lived in town, I would have a milk carton every few months. And so I would just get rid of it somewhere. Now I have a little more than that. I don't know why living on that country makes more trash, but, um, but still it's little enough that I have a couple of friends that I can take it to their places. Um, so lifestyle is more, more a part of my activism than I would like. I think that lifestyle is, is more a matter of changing my mind than it is a matter of actually having an impact. Um, so I have some engagement with um, Minnesota, it's called Line 3. It's a pipeline that uh, Enbridge decided should be moved. They didn't want to rip up the old one and replace it in place. They um, wanted to have a new route, goes through lots of wild rice fields, crosses the Mississippi River a couple of times, crosses, I think it's 108 streams. So I've been involved in, um, I like ceremonies the best. So we did this beautiful ceremony at the governor's office um, a year ago, just, just before things shut down. Um, I've been involved in actions related to stopping line three. And I've sent the money because somehow my life is so busy that I can't go up there. It really, it's painful to me that I am not up there in that camp. Um, you know, building the lodge. They, so they built, I'm not sure what it was, but it was some traditional sacred dwelling in right in the path of the pipeline. You know, that's, that's what people do. And they got some federal official to say that this was a protected historical structure. So there are all these little ways of, throwing monkey wrenches into the works. And meanwhile, they are clear cutting, you know, they are, they're determined that they're going to win. And our governor for a while, he's doing okay with the coronavirus, but he's doing very badly in terms of protecting the natural world, respecting indigenous rights and so forth. Um, so I've testified a number of times I somehow never write letters to newspapers, although I think that's a useful thing to do. Um, hmm. And what else have I done? I don't know. Well, one important thing wow. you're doing now is you're serving on Sunshine's board of directors. Oh. So I just want to throw out there for folks who are interested in perhaps practicing with Shoto, going to mountains and waters, seeing what she's doing, being in that environment. Um, if you go to the board of directors page on our website, there are links there. There's a link there to her website. And so you can make your way uh, and find out some more about what she's doing and how to be in touch with her. Um, in times where travel is possible, Sanshin always does, has been doing uh, an annual joint retreat. We do a land care retreat where folks from Sanshin, from here, like uh, you know Iris and Hoshin and me and folks will actually go up there and help her work on the land for a weekend. So we practice together. Um, and, you know, and work together on the land. So that's always a really nice time. It's nice to have this kind of joint 
uh, practice. Folks come from the Twin Cities, we come from here, folks come from wherever, um, and we get to actually do a weekend of land care as practice. Uh, so my hope is when times are more normal, should that ever happen, uh, we again get to do land care. But just I want to just throw out there, if you want to find out more about what she's doing and be in touch with Shoto, you can go right to our webpage and that'll get you there. Well, it just occurred to me that Russ invited me to talk about the Mountains and Waters Alliance and I thought of everything but that. So, <laughs> so there's this thing, I just put in the, um, uh, the website address, which includes, um, well, I wrote about, but I didn't make the calendar for the things that are coming up this year. Um, intro to Zen on Wednesday nights, you don't need that. You've got intro to Zen and you have Wednesday night activities. Um, on Sunday evenings, a group called The Gift of Fearlessness. This started out as a response to coronavirus. Uh, most recently, we've been discussing certain political events. Um, and ultimately, underneath it all, there's climate change and the um, What's the word? The the not, destruction isn't the right word, but the depletion of the environment, the depletion of the world in which we live. Um, so I do land care retreats, which are retreats. People come here and visit and work. There's a lot of space here. So I have when somebody we always have the conversation about what's an appropriate level of protection. And um, sometimes like the land care retreat, we did almost everything outdoors. Until it must have been 100 degrees and we went into the Zendo because there were only a few of us. Um, and, um, and in my dreams, there are people who are taking care of the world in this way around the world. Um, you know, I, it's included in the morning chanting and our, our dedication mentions mentions lands and waters both as something that we chant for and right after after the buddhas and ancestors and so forth as something that's our source um, um i <laughs> What else can I say? You know, I write, actually, I wrote two blog posts this month, month, which is exceptional, but I just had to say something about the events at the Capitol. Um, but so, so I write, um, people come here, people come and study. We, we do the practice of taking care of the earth and then we go out or other people go out and I stay here. Um, and engaging with what's local. Like if I were in Bloomington, I would be engaged either in transition town or in working on one of those uh, forest protection things. Um, people who have the stomach for lobbying are much appreciated. Um, I am not calm enough to lobby Republican senators. My, my, my representative is one of the people who objected to the certification. And um, anyway, so, so I considered CCL and I couldn't do it. <laughs> but there's lots to do. Um, I don't remember the name. So, so Interfaith Power and Light, there's a Bloomington chapter. I used to be part of it. I am loosely associated with the one that's in Minnesota. And um, it's like finding, finding somebody that you feel good about. It's like Indiana Forest Alliance is good, but if that's not your subject, you know, find somebody and work with them basically. <laughs> so, and I'm thinking, I wish, that I hadn't thought of coming with a whole list of organizations and websites to throw in the chat, but I didn't. I used to be an organizer and apparently I'm not anymore. 
<laughs> well, if you have things to pass along, of course, you can get those to me and I will, you know, post to the pandemic page or post someplace people can get that information if, if you if you desire. Yes. Okay. Okay. So thanks. And now we're over time. Shall we be done? Uh, Anybody I'm else? Ask one more thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to put this out there. Uh, are you feeling hopeful? Are you feeling encouraged? Oh, you know, I am, you know, that everybody knows this now, the Chinese characters for crisis means danger and opportunity. So sometimes I'm really scared. Right now, I am more scared of political violence than I am of the slower things. Um, and on the other hand, I see so much movement, so much um, change of heart. I mean, the kind of change of heart that I was talking about today, people respond when I talk about that. It's like, I, the first time I gave a talk at the uh, Sodas and Buddhist Association, which is a pre priest group, I expected to be alone. I have time after time found that, um, that the other Sotos and priests are with me, or, or a large number of them are with me. And that encourages me. Watching people organize encourages me. Um, so, so it's a scary time. You know, and I don't know what'll happen to me personally, although, you know, I'm in good health and all that. Um, but I don't, I find myself, I, I know people who are like really upset about what's happening and barely able to function. And I watch myself for that. It's like, maybe that need for extra sleep is some of that discouragement, depression, what have you. But mostly I'm like, oh, okay. And I think some of that is because I have engaged as a person who does things instead of being helpless. I am an actor, I am a co-creator and I can co-create lethargy and apathy, or I can co-create um, enthusiasm and love of the natural world. So, um, yeah, I do avoid watching really depressing information, but <laughs> I have enough of it, you know, I'll, I'll pick up a little, little bits of it. So, are there other uh, questions or comments out there? Dennis. Uh, I can't resist a comment on, on current events. Um, I was reading an article. Uh, can you hear me? Because yes. my, my, my laptop is dying. Uh, it will be reborn. I'll get a new one in a week or two. Uh, reading an article in Biblical Archaeology Magazine, no less, about the 4th and 5th Egyptian dynasties uh, and their constructions. And for about 100 years, this is interesting, Egypt was ruled uh, not by uh, uh, Middle Eastern, you know, physically featured people, but by Black African featured people. And we have the proof of that in the, in the monuments they made. Uh, and then that dynasty collapsed on another dynasty. And one of the things that collapsed it was changes in the deities that were their hierarchy of deities. They were, they were uh, 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 multi-theists, of course, but the hierarchy was important. And the conclusion of the, of the writer of the article was that when a civilization loses common assumptions, common language, 
uh, common beliefs, the civilization dissolves. Mm -hmm. And it's entirely possible that we could be in a moment of watching our civilization dissolve. That's not impossible. But what the next paragraph, he says, there was, after all, a fifth, sixth, seventh, seventeenth, twenty-seventh dynasty, that something new comes out of that. And we may be in for a very painful time, uh, but we're also don't know what new thing is going to come out of this. And uh, I want to appreciate uh, what I felt was a deeply blessed time with you, Shodu. I feel like I know you a lot better now. Uh, I feel blessed by listening to you. Uh, I don't have a good blessing in return, uh, but we do live in the interesting times. <laughs> uh, but we don't know uh, what wonderful thing may come of those interesting times, uh, even though we don't enjoy it. Like Dennis, that. thank you so much. Thank you for that comment. I will just add, I, I carry no hope for this civilization to survive. I hope that it fades gently rather than violently, but it is destroying the planet and it needs to go. <laughs> and that is some of my hope, which somehow it's like, well, the right questions all get asked all together, but. <laughs> this, this means agreement, by the way. Okay. Oh, I can't see it. You put your, did you put your. Uh, oh, it's a fist nod. Thing? Yeah. Okay. All right. So thanks. <laughs>